Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. In this video I'm going to be talking you through the entire topic of photosynthesis, topic 13 for CIE exam board. And if you ever need any more help then don't forget to check out my A-level notes linked below which cover all of the theory. It has key marking points, key terms and key examiner's tips as well. But for now let's get into the content. So topic 13 is all about photosynthesis and we start by looking at the structure of a chloroplast which is where photosynthesis happens. So you've come across this already when learning about cells and cell organelles. So you should have some idea already about the thylakoid membranes, which we can see here are folded to make these disc-like stacks, which are the granum. And the thylakoid membranes, that is where you have lots of proteins embedded, which is going to be the site of chemiosmosis in the light-dependent reactions, which we're going to come on to. The stroma is this fluid filled centre, which is the location of the light independent reactions. And there's lots of enzymes in the stroma for catalyzing those reactions, which we'll come on to later. And then we've got the inner and outer membrane. This is a double membrane bound organelle. So you don't find them in prokaryotic cells because it is membrane bound. So inside of the chloroplast, there is chlorophyll and chlorophyll is located in the photosystems, which are proteins embedded on the thylakoid membrane. And it's a mix of colored proteins that absorb light. That's what chlorophyll is. There's about five closely related types of pigments. In reality, there's lots, but you don't need to know all of them. Chlorophyll A is the most abundant and the other pigments are listed below as well. So chlorophyll A is a pigment which is bluey green in colour found in all plants. Chlorophyll B is a yellowy green colour. The carotenoids are orange. The xanthophylls are yellow and the phaophytins are grey. And these different pigments look different colours because they reflect different wavelengths of light which also means they absorb different wavelengths of light. And this is why it's an advantage for plants to have different pigments because that will maximize the amount of light energy that can be absorbed across the spectrum of the visible light wavelengths. And each plant has a different proportion of each pigment, which is why the leaves look slightly different colors. But that is the advantage. And we can see it here on this absorption graph against the wavelength. It's actually only showing chlorophyll A and B on this graph. But we can see even just those two different pigments, which are both shades of green, absorb wavelengths or different wavelengths at different proportions. And if we were to add in the other pigments, we'd have an even bigger spectrum of the wavelengths where we'd have higher absorption and ultimately as i said that means light you're going to have more light energy being absorbed for photosynthesis so chlorophyll b xanthophylls and carotenoids those are all embedded within the thylakoid membrane and form a light harvesting system and by that we mean it's where light energy of different wavelengths is absorbed and this energy is then transferred to the reaction center the reaction center contains chlorophyll a and is where light dependent reactions occur. So the light harvesting system and the reaction center combined make up a photosystem. So back to looking at chlorophyll then, as I said, each pigment can absorb a different range of wavelengths of light within the visible light spectrum, but 500 to 550 nanometers is poorly absorbed by all pigments. So wavelengths within this range are reflected and that's why leaves look green. The advantage we've already talked about, but it's now starting to link more specifically to the light dependent stage of photoionization and photolysis. The pigments in chlorophyll can be isolated using chromatography, which is one of the practicals you're expected to know how to do. So for example, TLC chromatography, which this image here is from a TLC, which is thin layer chromatography. The pigments from the plant would be added at the origin line to your TLC paper. You would then place the paper in solvent. The pigments dissolve in that solvent and depending on how soluble each pigment is in that solvent means how far up the TLC paper the pigment can travel. You can then calculate an RF value which is a value that you can use to compare and identify pigments in chromatography. And the way you work out an RF value is using this formula below. So you'd have to measure with a ruler the distance moved by the pigment from the origin point to the center of the point of the pigment. So looking at the distance the pigment moved. And we'd measure it from the center because 
you can see here that the pigment is actually quite spread out. So measuring from the center each time standardizes the method, but also it's a way of working out the average distance moved. And then you divide that by the distance from origin to the solvent front. So measuring from this point to wherever the solvent traveled up to. And that's why when you take your TLC paper out of the solvent, you have to draw a line straight away to show where the solvent traveled to because the solvent will evaporate and you won't be able to see that afterwards. So we're then going to move on to the actual reactions of photosynthesis. And it begins with the light dependent reactions. And this involves the harvesting of energy from light. And the purpose of this stage is to use that light energy to split water and to create ATP and the reduced coenzyme NADP, which are then needed in the subsequent stages of the light independent reactions. Now the light dependent reactions happen on the thylakoid membrane or the gran, which is the stacks of those membranes. It involves four key steps, which we're going to go through. Non-cyclic photophosphorylation, cyclic or cyclic photophosphorylation, photolysis, and chemiosmosis. So we're going to start with the non-cyclic phosphorylation or photophosphorylation. This involves two photosystems, photosystem one and photosystem two. Photosystem two is the first one to be used, which is confusing because it's called number two, but it's the first one that's used, but that's just the way it is. And that photosystem has pigments within it to absorb light, with a wavelength of 700 nanometers. Photosystem one is then used and it absorbs light with a wavelength of 680 nanometers. So here we can see those two photosystems embedded within the thylakoid membrane. We've got photosystem two, photosystem one. And on this side of the membrane, it's the stroma. On this side of the membrane, it is the lumen. So it's the space within the foldings of that thylakoid membrane. So light energy is absorbed. So the light shining from, it could be the sunlight, for example, is absorbed by the pigments within photosystem two. And this causes the electrons within the reaction center of photosystem two to become excited and they are then released. The electrons released from photosystem two and from photosystem one, so it happens to both of these photosystems, move along an electron transport chain. That is what these proteins are here. And you don't need to know the names of these. You just need to know that there are proteins embedded within the thylakoid membrane and the electrons are going to be excited and released from the photosystem one, photosystem two, and then they pass along these electrons, which is the electron transport chain. This results in ATP production by ATP synthase over here, and that's chemiosmosis. And the electrons lost from photosystem two are replaced by electrons from photolysis, which we're going to go on to chemiosmosis and photolysis in the next couple of slides. The electrons lost from photosystem one are replaced by the electrons at the end of the electron transport chain from photosystem two. So as the electrons are lost from photosystem two and pass along the electron transport chain, that is then picked up by photosystem one. In comparison, the electrons that are lost from photosystem one and move along the electron transport chain, those are picked up by the coenzyme NADP, and that is then what reduces the NADP to NADPH or reduced NADP. So the reduced NADP and the ATP that are made are used in the next stages of photosynthesis, which is the light independent reactions. But there's still more to say on the light dependent reactions first. Cyclic photophosphorylation is the next step. And this is happening simultaneously because as that light energy is absorbed by photosystem one, we said that the electrons are excited, raise an energy level and they're released and they pass along the electron transport chain. And some of them are picked up by NADP to become reduced NADP. But some of them are instead recycled back into photosystem one. And that transport of electrons still results in ATP production through chemiosmosis, which is a process we're going to come on to. Therefore, cyclic phosphorylation results in the production of ATP, but not the production of reduced NADP, because it's this cycling background into photosystem one bypasses this step. The electrons are not being picked up by NADP. Instead, they're recycled back into photosystem one. So cyclic photophosphorylation just results in ATP production, 
whereas non-cyclic photophosphorylation results in ATP and reduced NADP production. So the other stages then, this is all happening simultaneously. Photolysis or photolysis, photo means light, lysis means splitting. So this is a stage where the light energy is absorbed by the chlorophyll and that energy splits water into oxygen, electrons and protons. The protons, the H+, is picked up by the NADP to form reduced NADPH. The electrons are going to be passing along the electron carrier proteins and the electron transport chain. The oxygen isn't used in photosynthesis, so it might be used in respiration or it will just diffuse out of the stomata and leaf. So chemiosmosis then, this is the last bit just to look through. And the diagram, you can see here again the effects of non-cyclic photophosphorylation and also cyclic phosphorylation and how we get the reduced NADP and ATP production. But the main thing we're focusing on here is how we get the ATP production because we've not explained that part yet. So the electrons that gained energy and left the chlorophyll in photosystem 2 and it would happen in photosystem 1 as well, move along those proteins in the electron transport chain. As they move along these proteins, they release energy. And that energy is used to pump protons from the stroma into the thylakoid lumen, so across the membrane. This results in an electrochemical gradient. So you'll have lots of protons in the thylakoid lumen compared to in the stroma. And because of this electrochemical gradient, those protons will now move by facilitated diffusion back into the stroma down their concentration gradients. But the only way they can do that is through the enzyme ATP synthase because protons, they have a charge, they can't dissolve and diffuse through by simple diffusion in the thylakoid membrane. And the only protein that they are able to bind to and travel through is ATP synthase. So as they move through ATP synthase, that catalyzes or activates ATP synthase to catalyze ADP and PI in organic phosphate joining together in a condensation reaction to make ATP. So that's how we make the ATP. Those protons have now moved back across to the stroma. Some of those protons are then going to be picked up by NADP, which is also picking up the electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. And that is how we create the reduced NADP, or in other words, NADPH. So that is how we get the ATP and the reduced NADP, both of which are needed for the light independent reactions, which is a second stage of photosynthesis, which is also known as the Calvin cycle. Now this stage happens in the stroma and it involves the enzyme Rubisco, and it's a temperature sensitive stage because of the enzymes. Now the Calvin cycle uses carbon dioxide as well as the two products from the light dependent reaction, reduced NADP and ATP and it creates the hexo sugars, or in other words, the organic substances that the plant is then going to use to make carbohydrates, amino acids, lipids, all the organic substances that it needs. And this stage involves ATP from the light dependent reactions being hydrolyzed to provide energy for the reactions and the reduced NADP donating the hydrogen atoms, which is a proton and an electron, to reduce molecules, for example, GP in the cycle. But let's have a look at it step by step. So we begin here, carbon dioxide is reacting with ribulose bisphosphate or RUBP. And we've got a five carbon combining with a one carbon compound and that creates a six carbon compound. You don't actually need to know that step, but the six carbon compound splits into two molecules of GP. And this is a step that requires the enzyme Rubisco. Those two molecules of GP are both reduced to two molecules of triose phosphate, or here it's summarized as TP. And that is going to be reduction because the hydrogen, which is a proton and electron from reduced NADP, is picked up by those two GP molecules. And this stage also requires energy from ATP. Now, once we've got those two molecules of TP, one carbon 
from the two molecules of TP is removed from the cycle each turn of the cycle. Now only one is, which means we're left with five carbons, and those five carbons are then going to be regenerated, joined together to make RUBP again. And that regeneration stage again requires ATP. It's the energy from ATP is needed to join together the three and the two carbon compound. And that one carbon that is removed each turn is going to go towards making the useful organic substances. So it takes six turns of the Calvin cycle before you have six carbons to create a hexo sugar such as glucose. And whilst glucose is the product, that monosaccharide could join together with fructose to make sucrose, or many glucose molecules could join together in condensation reactions to make polysaccharides such as cellulose and starch. Or the hexo sugars could be converted into glycerol, which is three carbon sugar, and that goes towards making the lipids, or you could even add nitrogen to it to start to make an amino acid. So there are limiting factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis, and that is temperature, carbon dioxide concentration, and the light intensity. So with the light intensity, as you increase light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis increases at the lower light intensities. And that's because the more light there is, you'll have more photolysis of water and you'll have more electrons being excited and released in cyclic and non-cyclic photophosphorylation and therefore you ultimately get more reduced NADP and ATP used in the Calvin cycle. It does though level off or plateau at the high light intensities and at that point there would be another factor limiting the rate. So you've already got to your optimum light intensity so at this point it must be there's not enough carbon dioxide for the calvin cycle or it might be the temperature is not high enough to reach the optimum temperature for the enzymes carbon dioxide concentration we have the same curve at the lower concentrations of carbon dioxide we see that it is limiting the rate because we've got this um, directly proportional relationship and that would be because carbon dioxide is required to react with ribulose bisphosphate or IEBP in the Calvin cycle. However, again, we get to the point where the rate of reaction plateaus, and at that point, there must be another factor limiting the rate of photosynthesis, and that would either be the light intensity or temperature. Temperature, the shape of the graph is different because this is linked to enzymes. So you might have a steep curve like this, or it might be more gradual and then a drop off. Because as you increase the temperature, the enzymes will be gaining and also the substrates will be gaining more kinetic energy. So you'd get more successful collisions between the enzyme and the substrate. And therefore, the reaction happens faster. But beyond the optimum temperature, the enzyme starts to denature. And that's why the rate of reaction doesn't plateau. It actually decreases because if the enzymes are denaturing, then we aren't catalyzing the reaction. Now, for maximum photosynthesis, in agriculture, they'll need to try and find a balance between the optimum amount of light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration and temperature, but offset that with how much it costs to have that heating, to have that extra lighting compared to how much extra profit they're getting from how much the plants are actually growing. So you do have to consider how cost effective it is to potentially pay for paraffin to burn it, which would release carbon dioxide, but also increase the temperature and to pay for artificial lighting. So that is it for topic 13 on photosynthesis. Hope you found it helpful. If you did, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of my latest videos.